We've seen that several phenomena cause irreversibility in thermodynamic processes. The presence of friction, heat transfer through a finite temperature difference, or mixing of two or more substances. The first law doesn't tell us if a process is irreversible or in what direction it really proceeds. Energy is always conserved. When we pour boiling water into a container of ice, the first law states that the internal energy of the hot water plus that of the ice will sum up to the internal energy of the mixture that remains when the ice melts. Now we'll just wave our magic wand and let the warm water spontaneously separate into boiling water and ice like this. This is perfectly okay according to the first law. Energy is still conserved. Well, first law or not, our experience tells us that the real world doesn't work that way. Warm water doesn't just spontaneously turn back into ice and hot water. Our experience tells us that processes will proceed in one direction and are unlikely to go in the reverse direction. Even in the time of the Industrial Revolution, it was evident to some of the founders of thermodynamics that one law wasn't sufficient to describe how real systems behave. We need a second law of thermodynamics to account for directionality. Historically, the study of heat engines led to the second law. The second law of thermodynamics really deals mainly with thermal and chemical systems, but we can use a simple mechanical analogy, a water wheel, to gain some insight into its development. If we ignore kinetic energy, the work producing potential of the water is just its potential energy relative to the bottom flume. To convert the maximum amount of that potential into shaft work, we need a perfectly frictionless wheel that is exactly the same size as the gap between the flumes. The first law applied to this situation tells us how much work can be derived from a given amount of water flowing through the wheel. If we store up the work from the ideal wheel, for example by raising a weight, we should be able to use it as a pump to restore the water to its original height. But if the wheel is smaller than the distance between the flumes, some of the water's potential is lost without doing any work. When we try to reverse the wheel, it cannot raise all the water back to its original height. The efficiency of the water wheel could be defined as its net work output divided by the total potential energy of the water. By this definition, the efficiency of a perfectly sized frictionless wheel would be 100%. Now, let's turn our attention to heat engines, which are devices that convert thermal energy into mechanical work. Any heat engine can be considered as a general system, which takes in energy from a high temperature reservoir, uses a working fluid in a cycle to convert some of it into work, and rejects the remaining energy to a lower temperature reservoir. We assume the reservoirs are so large that their temperatures stay fixed no matter how much energy is added or removed. The efficiency of a heat engine is the ratio of its net work output to the thermal energy input by heat transfer. If the water wheel analogy holds, the reservoir temperatures would be like the heights of the flumes. The maximum amount of work would be produced when the temperatures of the engine working fluid exactly match those of the reservoirs so that the heat transfer into the water would be reversible. But if the engine working temperatures do not match those of the reservoirs, some of the thermal potential to do work will be lost as heat is transferred to and from the working fluid across a finite delta T. A brilliant Frenchman by the name of Sadi Carnot recognized that the temperatures of the reservoirs with which an engine exchanges heat must define its maximum work producing potential. Carnot was the son of a high official in the government of France and served as an engineering officer in Napoleon's army before returning to his studies at the École Polytechnique. In 1824, at the age of 28, he presented a paper which was to become a milestone in thermodynamics. The paper was entitled Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire and on Machines Fitted to Develop that Power. It was a remarkable work grounded in extensive physical observations and culminating in an elegant statement that formed the original basis for the second law. The motive power of heat is independent of the agents employed to realize it. Its quantity is fixed solely by the temperatures of the bodies between which is effected, finally, the transfer of the caloric. By motive power of heat, Carnot was referring to the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine, that is, the most work that could be derived from a heat source. He hypothesized that the perfect engine would take in all its heat at the maximum reservoir temperature, convert it to work through a series of reversible processes, 
and reject all heat at the lowest reservoir temperature. Carnot's statement can be translated into this simple equation, which expresses the maximum possible efficiency of a heat engine, we now call the Carnot efficiency, in terms of the absolute values of the reservoir temperatures. The equation immediately tells us not only what is possible and what is not, but also sets limits on performance of real power cycles. First, note that the efficiency can be one only if T min is zero, that is, if the engine rejects heat to absolute zero temperature, or if T max is infinity. Neither of these conditions is even theoretically possible, so one direct consequence of Carnot's statement is that it is impossible to fully convert heat into work, no matter how good the engine and what working fluid it operates on. For a number of reasons, it is impractical to build a real power plant using a Carnot cycle, but it is still valuable in exploring the theoretical limits of real cycles. So let's compare several kinds of cycles used to generate electricity. A modern coal-fired steam power plant operates at a maximum steam temperature of about 550 degrees Celsius, or 823 kelvins, and a minimum temperature of about 25 degrees Celsius, or 298 kelvins. The efficiency of a Carnot cycle operating between these temperatures would be 64%. Due to irreversibilities and non-isothermal heat flows, a real coal plant will have an efficiency of about 40%, roughly two-thirds of the Carnot efficiency. Nuclear power plants cannot achieve steam temperatures as high as those of a coal plant because of temperature limits on the materials used to contain the nuclear fuel pellets. A nuclear plant with a maximum temperature of 300 degrees Celsius, or 573 kelvins, condensing at 25 degrees Celsius, will have a Carnot efficiency of only about 48%. Real nuclear plants achieve efficiencies of around 32%, or again, about two-thirds of the Carnot efficiency. Thus, for a given heat input, nuclear plants cannot generate as much useful power as coal plants, or conversely, they require more heat for a given power output, and hence they reject more waste heat to the environment. Modern gas turbine plants can operate at very high temperatures, typically 1,000 degrees Celsius, but they also reject heat at temperatures of around 200 degrees Celsius, well above those of coal and nuclear plants. The Carnot efficiency corresponding to these temperatures is about 63%, comparable to that of a coal-fired steam unit. But in actual practice, gas turbines achieve efficiencies only about half the Carnot efficiency. Carnot's famous efficiency principle can be extended to other types of thermodynamic systems, such as refrigerators and heat pumps, in addition to heat engines. It is truly one of the fundamental foundations of modern engineering. Most importantly, Sadiq Carnot was the first to explore and quantify the nature of irreversibility as it applies to energy conversion systems. His work gave us the basis for measuring performance of real machines and led to the invention of a new thermodynamic property called entropy. By studying entropy, we'll be able to identify and quantify irreversibilities and find ways to reduce them in thermodynamic devices.